good. Someone gets to see my big head staring at the screen. <laughs> okay, uh, so how many people attended my previous talk on container security? Excellent. So this is the exact opposite. So this is totally <laughs> turning the security off. How many people here have played with Project Atomic or Atomic Host? Okay, in a, um, so if you're following the development of the operating system, or the, what, we're, what we're trying to do in the, pro, the Atomic project is sort of build a new way of using operating systems. And the goal here is to make an operating system that the only software you ever install on it is going to be containers. And in order to do that, uh, we need to uh, allow containers to, contain, to have uh, applications in them that might manage the host or might manage other containers. So we need, in that case, what we need to do is build a container platform, a way to run containers in such a way that the container uh, can break out of its containment. All right. So one of the, uh, I've been working in container technology for many, many years. Obviously, I'm the SC Linux guy for many, for, for 100 years at Red Hat. But I've also been using namespaces all the way back to RHEL 5. So uh, Fedora, I think it was Fedora 5, we, we started using namespaces. So, na um, so namespaces and SE Linux and other types of confinement capabilities, things like that, are all things that we're using to uh, confine uh, or to, to define what this thing is called a container. Uh, so for many, many years we've been using this technology, uh, but most people weren't, really didn't understand it until Docker came along. And what the really interesting thing about Docker is not so much the container, I mean, the, all, all the Docker is really doing is taking advantage of uh, stuff that the Linux kernel provides. But the really cool thing they did is new packaging format. So what we're looking for is, so as we move forward, I believe that people should start packaging software in, in uh, uh, high-level applications in the form of containers. All right, so you, you, your low-level tools should still be built in RPMs and stuff like that. But as you get to higher-level application suites, you can package those up in containers. And we want to basically make containers a new way of shipping software in the system. But in order to do that, we, if we say we're going to do that, we want to build platforms that are really optimized for running that, but again, we need uh, more advanced applications. So if I'm, the only way I'm going to ship software is inside of a container, and then I have a host system that all it can do is run containers, then I have to get to handle these advanced system management type tools. Uh, so actually, this is a uh, Unixware containers. I guess the uh, <laughs> I guess in China they uh, decided that you know they they tell me yet? <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> I guess not. Uh, they jumped jumped the gun on uh, container technology. <laughs> so obviously, no one in this room should tell uh, DC Comics that I'm stealing their logos. Okay, uh, so we're talking instead of just standard containers, we're talking super containers. So on Atomic Host, I, we don't have YUM install. Um, we want to make the Atomic Host minimal. So we don't want to, uh, everybody that plays with Atomic Host, the first time they get on there and they say, this is awesome. Atomic Host, it's a minimal install. But what I really need is I need this package install. I need strace. I need ping. I need um, I don't know, man pages. I need, you know, everybody gets on there and they, and they get instantaneously frustrated because, you know, it's a minimal install. So everybody wants a minimal install with just their additional packages. Um, so, um, so, what we really, our goal is just to keep it as minimal as possible, and if you need extra stuff, you're going to install containers. So, how do I administrate, uh, how do I uh, admin a machine without strace, gdb, trace route? Yeah, so, really, we're, we're, as an admin now, you're going to be starting to look at, um, you got to start thinking about the world differently. So, um, these container platforms. So, this, this machine, uh, Project Atomic, is not your desktop machine. Okay, this is a pure server play, a pure cloud, you know, image um, environment. It's not something that you want to run, you know, a desktop on. Although I think someone's building a atomic-based uh, desktop platform. Uh, customers want to install their favorite tools on Atomic Host. Uh, atomic. Uh, so the rule on the Atomic team, uh, the Atomic Host team, right now the rule is you have to, if you want to get a piece of software into Atomic Host. You have to prove that you can't do it inside of a container. Okay, so you have to basically prove that you can't do it inside a container. We put some stuff in Atomic Host we want to get out because we made mistakes. For instance, Kubernetes. We want to get Kubernetes the hell out of Atomic Host and make that run as a container. All right. 
the only thing, my end goal with Latonic Post is the only thing you're going to get is the kernel, system D, journal D, and Docker. Okay. Getting rid of SSH daemon is a little bit difficult. Uh, and then there's some other package. Right now, for instance, our syslog, if you want to run our syslog, that comes in the form of a can. Um, so really what we want to do is just get that thing down as minimal as possible. So another problem state, I want to ship an application that will manage the host. So what happens if I want to manage the host operating system? I want to ship an application to manage containers. So we, we introduced about, I think, back in uh, before Christmas this year, we introduced the concept of super privileged containers. So there is no such thing as a super privileged container. I'm going to explain the concept. Anybody, everybody in here has played with Docker at some point? So you know about dash dash privileged. So dash dash privileged just basically says turn off all security. It basically you know, literally says root is root on the system. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't get rid of namespaces. The super privileged container, we're going to get rid of namespaces, or the concept of it. So it's really just a concept, a way to run certain types of containers. SBCs will manipulate the content on the host. SBCs can be used to manipulate other containers. Turn off the security. First step to running a super privileged container is turn off the security. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll go through that stuff. Okay. First time I did this talk at actually Twitter. Uh, some people did go out and tweet it. Uh, so privilege container, you need to turn off the security. So the way you do that in Docker is you run, so I'm going I'm to go through a whole bunch of commands here, but basically in Docker you run dash dash privilege, that turns off SE Linux, turns off the capability. You know, it, it, as I said, if you went to my previous talk, we talked about uh, read-only file system, read-only kernel file system, we talked about SE Linux, we talked about capabilities. We talked in the future about SecConf. All that stuff, use the namespace, it all gets turned off as soon as you do dash dash privilege. But we still have um, we still have a problem that you have namespace separation. So even though I turn off, even though I run Docker uh, privilege, if I do a PS command, I only see my processes. I don't see all the other processes in the system. I'm still in my network namespace, so I still don't have access to the network. Uh, uh, the real network on the host. I don't have access to shared memory from host processes. I don't have uh, other accesses to the host. So what we've been, what Red Hat's been working with Docker um, and is contributing all sorts of things to turn off namespaces. So you can do a docker run now, dash dash net equals host, and that says to share the network namespace with the host operating system. Really it says don't use the network namespace. Docker run IPC equals host says share the host IPC namespace. Um, for instance, dev share mem, dev qmem, all that stuff is, is uh, shared. De dev docker run dash dash pid equals host means don't give me a pid namespace. So as soon as I do this one, I get to see all the processes on the system. This next part, so, so that gets me to, so what I can do with these commands is I can get to the point that the only thing I'm using inside of my container is the mount namespace. So I have my own version of slash user, which I want because if I'm going to ship my own software into the system, I want to have my own operating system, my own host operating system. But I need to get access to the host operating systems, the host file systems. So we want to mount the host file systems into the container. Uh, one of the things we, uh, I mean, in all, you don't have to do all of these to do super privileged containers. You can do uh, partial ones, but we're going to get down to the final command. But if I just do a docker run dash b slash run colon run, that means mount the bind mount the host slash run into the container. As soon as I do that, I'm able to interact. If I do that with dash dash privilege, I'd be able to interact with system D. I'd be able to interact with uh, dbus. I'd be able to interact with Docker. So I could actually, if I run a container like this, I can actually start and stop Docker containers. Right? Because anybody can talk to slash run Docker sock, I can get access to it. If I run Docker run dash v dev dev, that means slash share slash dev into my container. So we have a, one of the first super privileged containers we built was libvirt. So in libvirt uh, world, we wanted to basically allow libvirt to launch VMs, but we didn't want to ship libvirt. Uh, everybody knows what libvirt is. It's a, it's a tool we use to launch virtual machines. 
we wanted to run libvirt on atomic host, but we didn't want to have to add all libvirt into it. We want to run libvirt in a container, but we needed slash dev so that it could go out and create device nodes and things like that. Uh, uh, actually, libvirt also required the dash dash pit equals host and a few other uh, additional features, but now you can run libvirt. As a matter of fact, if you've looked at the COLA project, K-O-L-L-A, that's an effort to containerize all of OpenStack inside of Docker containers. And those require, a few of those require superfocus containers. Uh, allows the container process to communicate with debug system, they already covered that. Um, so the, 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 so the granddaddy of them all is actually down here, docker run dash v slash to slash host. Um, we're doing, so that basically says mount the entire root file system into the container. That's also, any, any mount points under slash, basically is bind mounting slash into the container. And we've basically said we're going to standardize us being Project Atomic that the way you do this is slash host. Not only that, but we're also setting an environment. We, we say you should set an environment available for uh, dollar sign host in the container to point to slash host. And then you could build your scripts to be able to run if the dollar host isn't set, it'll run on the native machine. If the dollar host is set, then it'll change, you know, basically go into a subdirector. And we're going to show you that in a minute. I'm cutting off the bottom of the screen, and I can't, even standing up here, I can't look down and see what that is, but I'm sure it's. <laughs> I'm sure it's real interesting. Okay, so it's best right now if I do a demo and I'm going to have to walk around and I'm going to show you all what happens when you do all this stuff. Okay, so here's a standard container, Fedora container. Okay, I don't even have a ps command, but basically, you know, ID. Now, one of the interesting things inside of containers is we actually lie to SE Linux inside of the container, telling it that uh, SE Linux is disabled, even though SE Linux is enabled. The reason we do that is to stop applications from trying to do SE Linux activity. It's not for security, it's basically to stop, um, you know, tools from, oh, I'm on an SE Linux enabled system, I should try to do something because it's going to be blocked. So this is actually, obviously, I would never run this uh, SE Linux system disabled. If I go over here, so you see on the same host, it's enforcing, it's just lying inside the container. But if I did a cat, I would proc. That shows you the SE Linux label. Uh, so yeah, I don't want a PS command, but basically this shows you the SE Linux label. So this is a fully confined container. So now I'm going to do the same thing. I have a question about the label. Yeah. So I have a question that Docker used to use LFC, but it no longer does. Yes. Yeah, you're still using the LFC label? Um, LFC, well. Yeah. Let's use a little history of LXC. So yeah. LXC means different things to different people. Okay. <laughs> so LXC, in your definition, means LXC toolset that was developed by IBM to yeah. build LXC containers. LXC is also a shorthand for Linux containers. Yeah. So we're using it as in interpretation of these are Linux containers. Oh, LXC okay. means that. Uh, it also could be libvirt LXC, which is an implementation of libvirt that uses does Linux containers. So yeah, uh, if if I had a go back machine and I might eventually go back, I'm going to call that container T and get yeah. rid of that, all that crap altogether. So the, that name was developed. This this policy was developed for libvirt running yeah. um, the old fashioned bird sandbox tools. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to go into a container and I'm going to do the same thing. Proc self at our current, and you can see it's now running as SBCT. Okay, so your SBCT is basically an unconfined process. Um, but I'm still in a container environment, so even though I'm privileged, you know, of course I can't show it because I don't have PS running here, but believe me, there's a. Slash proc yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there there's only two processes in here, 10 and 1. Um, so I basically still have no access to the host system. So now if I do. So if we start to do some of the pit equals host, that equals 
host. So it's just IPC equals host. And if I did that, so I am LSL proc. All of a sudden, I start to see lots and lots of processes on the system. I also, I don't think I have this config yet, but IP, what's the IP? Uh, I don't have any of these commands inside of the container, but basically, I'm now using the host network. So I basically have turned off all of the namespaces, uh, network namespace, I've turned off IPC namespace, and I've turned off PID namespace. So I now have full access to the namespaces, but I still don't have access to other parts of the operating system. But I can start going further and dash v of slash run colon slash run dash v of dev colon slash dev and slash v of slash slash host and so here I am inside of the container no still no command but I can do it to root slash host and suddenly I got the ps command why? because I'm on the host so if you read uh, Project Atomic blog, I actually blogged about the security problem of allowing Docker to listen to, uh, to allow global users to use Docker uh, sockets. But basically this just shows I totally broke out of containment. I am now fully uh, on confined T on the host and I can do anything I want. So it's kind of interesting, you know, so this is, all this stuff is, is the idea of a super privileged container. Um, if I went and looked back into the container and I looked at slash dev, I see those files, and if I look at the slash host slash dev, I see the same one. Did a different command, but basically, uh, see that. But also notice that suddenly, I see Linux started to work. Okay, because it basically I turned because I'm in a super privileged container, and I've now started to tell SE Linux you are enabled. Um, um, so you can start to see SE Linux stuff. So you can start to do relabeling and fix labels and anything you want. So. So let's go back to presentation. Okay. So who wants to type all that stuff every single time you write it, run a container? Right? I certainly don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a fundamental one of the fundamental problems with Docker as we get to these more advanced environments is you start to get more and more complex command lines. So one of the things we've looked at with, with uh, I guess I'll continue the presentation rather than jumping ahead. So when we looked at it, we wanted to build some new tooling to make this easier. But one of the things we've, we've talked about when you go into a container, um, and, and the, I don't know if it's a Fedora tools image yet, but there probably should be, especially after what I'm about to say. When you get onto an atomic host, Right, I talked earlier about doing S-Trace and things like that. You really need access to these tools, S-Trace, GDB, and relevant, relevant versions. We need a source report. We don't even have man pages. So you can't even say man docker to figure out how to run the docker commands while you're in the container. So what we've added is a tools image. And what a tools image is actually a great big container image that brings all this stuff. Really, it's sort of the admin shell. That's, that's the way um, I would think about it. So we bring, we package up a whole big ton of, of what you would expect, and we bring it down to the host, and then you could go into the container, run in a super privileged mode, and all of a sudden you've got your man page, you've got your uh, other content. And in order to do this, we wanted to introduce a new command. So we didn't want to just continue working with just the Docker command, we wanted to introduce a brand new command called the tonic. And I'm going to explain some of the uh, goals of Atomic. But basically what you can do with Atomic is you can do Atomic rel tools shell, and all of a sudden it's going to pull down the rel, it's going to basically do a docker doc pull, pull down um, the rel tools container, and you're going to be in super privileged mode as soon as you get into the container. And we'll show you that in a second. So it allows you to run containers in super privileged mode, and to run rel tools image, if you do Atomic run dash dash SPC rel tools bin shell, it will run that. Okay? Nothing more, you know, when we first started out with this, it was nothing more than basically a huge alias to say, hey, if I execute this command, then, then put all the super privileged stuff into the container. I think we're doing some other weird stuff like making sure the local time inside the container matches the local time on the host. Um, uh, we also add some name stuff. 
We also do something uh, by default in atomic shell is basically we're going to build a container here, pull it down to the system, and then we leave that container around. So you can do a yum update inside of this container, yum install inside of this container, add content, and every time you run the atomic command, you're going to enter re-enter that container. So that container becomes sort of a permanent uh, way that you can continue to do your uh, updates in the system. So we also wanted atomic. We wanted atomic to be the only command that you would need to execute to do management of the atomic, uh, the atomic host. Um, obviously, you can do Docker as well, uh, but we wanted to also wrap our RPM OS tree commands. So when if you play with Project Atomic, you have to do things like um, you know move to the next version, reboot the machine, atomic host reboot, atomic host, uh, I forget the shows what, how, many, how often I use atomic host, but um, they're basically the tools to, to manage OS tree, manage your host operating system, up, move it up and, and back the version. So, huh, I should have just gone with this. So you can do atomic host upgrade, atomic host rollback, and atomic host status to basically switch back and forth between different versions of the, of the atomic host. So problem state, my application is nicely rolled into a container. How do I tell a user to run it? This is one of the fundamental things we found wrong with Docker images. We want Docker container image, or, and now it's called open container image format, to be the default way that everybody ships applications. The problem right now is everybody has to ship an image and a description or a page somewhere that describes how to install the image, how to run the image, what is the command line, what, what um, benefits. So you have to go to two different sites to get information about how to run an application. So if I build a big application like um, IPA or a big application like OpenStack, we have to go out to these random sites and say, oh, you want to download this, this, and this. The developer of the tool cannot build something into the container image that tells, uh, basically instructs how to run his application. Another way to look at it is if you play with RPM, right now Docker does not have post install scripts for RPM. All right, so we wanted to build the concept, you know, the way to do a post install or install um, an application. My application runs mostly confined but needs one additional privilege. Uh, Free IPA was building an NTP daemon container. And the only thing, he ran totally locked down, but the only thing he needed was sys time, because NTPD has to change the system time. It could run um, with everything else locked down, but he needed to do that. If he just puts out a NTPD container, and you just download it and run it, it's going to blow up out of the box. So anytime you do a Docker run, that's going to blow up, unless you run with the cap at sys type. So I, as a developer, I want to somehow specify in the container that the way you run this application is by specifying. So we worked a long time, this, this patch was ridiculously long to get in, a way to add image data to the JSON file associated with the open container image. So we, we added a label patch, we've got Docker to add, finally add a label patch, and developers can add the content to the image JSON data. So one of the fields we've added is the label run. So what you can do is you can put, basically put an image data into your JSON file that says docker run dash d ntpd the name of the container, and then cap adds to say admin, and then we put keyword image. And what we can do with the atomic command when it sees image like this, it will substitute the image that you run. So if you say atomic run NTPD, it will change the image word there to say NTPD. We've added a few extra fields since then, and actually now it's dollar image, but you get the idea. So now to run, if, if the NTPD uh, container is built and you run it with the atomic run command, it will go into the JSON file, so it will pull the image down, it will go into the JSON file of the image, figure out what the Docker run, the label run command is, and then execute the label run for executing the command. This container will work perfectly fine with Docker, and you can go in, pull the image, and you can go look at the label, and it will tell you how to, how to run it, but you would have to run it manually. All we've done is wrapped, wrapped the ability you know, to look inside the container and figure out how it's going to run. So let's look at containers differently. Container image is a new way of shipping applications. We want to look at images as a software delivery mechanism that I talked early. I package up my JBoss application in a Docker image, move it to a repository, and then what? And that, at that point, that's where, to me, everybody stops. It's like, OK, uh, here's my image. Go to my website, and it'll have 15 pages of description of how to install it. Anybody ever look at the installing OpenStack? It is. A, 
friggin' disaster. It's like page after page after page of, of things you have to do. Huh? Yeah, well, I mean, what the, there's been like 10 different installation procedures of it. But if you look at the way, PackSat's getting easier, but if you look at Cola now and what Cola's going to become, yeah. it's going to be a single command. What I want it to be is Atomic Install OpenStack. Yeah. And then it comes up and it's going to it, come up to you and say, how many versions of Glance do you need? How many versions of this do you need? And you'll just go out to Kubernetes and, and, and configure the whole thing. I want to provide, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I just like to come up with ideas. I want someone else to do that. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. I'm all about Tom Sawyer and the, and the fence. <laughs> okay. How does, a, how does a customer install it? How do I configure it and run on must where, where does the config and where do the install scripts go? So we want to embed the installation procedure within the container image. So we also added a, a label called label install. So if you do an atomic install, it will read this line, and I can do a Docker run privileged few of the SVC commands and actually run an install script from inside the container that knows about slash host and will actually put out the system to unifile to set up to run the container. It'll go out and, and, and do all sorts of configuration data. It might prompt the user for commands, things like that. So this is not, we're not building up any high level tools here. All we're saying is, here's the command that I would instruct the user to write and I can embed my installation script right into the image, container image. And then obviously I need an uninstall for when I remove the application. This does not mean the application has to be an SPC application. It just means when I'm doing the install and the uninstall, I require privilege. Just like when you're running an RPM install, Apache that you run RPM install of Apache, it goes out and does privileged stuff on the system. But when you run Apache, it doesn't require privilege or run Firefox or something like that. So the idea is we can put built in super privileged container activity for uninstall and uninstall and you don't necessarily need super privileged container functionality for running the application. So we also came up with the concept of meta container images. So we have uh, an idea of something really complex like free IPA where it has 10 different services running. Right? We want to get to this microservices environment where you know, free IPA is made up of Kerberos, LDAP, Cert, uh, Cert Manager, uh, I don't know, probably two or three other uh, applications. Uh, we really don't want, again, to go to the page of install. Or, or I mean, right now, uh, Free IPA has a full install script. So I pull that install script. Do I have to rewrite that to use containers? Or can I build, build it directly into the container? So I, I envision that we will have a atomic install IPA. All I are free IPA, and all that's in the free IPA image is the install procedure, right? And it comes down, and it's going to prompt the user to say, "How do I do certain things? How do I, you know, install it?" Uh, and, and then the IPA can go out and figure the installation procedure can figure out: Is a Kubernetes available? Okay, install. Uh, I need uh, a replica server of Kerberos slave servers running on these IPAs. I need all that stuff. And then I've already mentioned OpenStack. So there's been a big effort to make all of OpenStack inside of Kohler uh, have these labels so that the, the, we can start to automate the installation. So again, right now Kohler is actually made up of 10 different uh, containers, you know, Glance, Nova, Libvirt, uh, whatever the, all those tools are. But we want to get to the point that instead of, doing, instead of having to go out and get the pack stack script, all you have to do, you don't have to pull down anything onto the machine, all you have to say is atomic install OpenStack and it's going to download the meta container image and that meta container image is going to start to prompt you to, to install stuff. I'm not going to be covering Nulicule, but Nulicule's goal is to get into a new way of defining these applications inside of the atomic application, inside of the atomic manager, inside of the image. So what might end up being these containers is a Nulicule specification. So imagine that you get this Nulicule, which we're now, uh, my team is trying to rewrite it all and go as a static binary. So now the Nulicule becomes, it's not RHEL, it's not Fedora, it's not anything, it's a Nulicule application. It comes down with the definition of how to install an application, and then that thing goes out and pulls down additional containers onto the system, or tells Kubernetes to go out and, and pull down containers onto the system. So you start to build, again, you're building an application, a, a, a distributed application suite here, and we're trying to make it as simple as humanly possible for an administrator to do this. How do you pronounce that uh, OpenStack product that 
Kola, K O L L A. K O L L A. Yeah. So in Boston, we would say Kola. Okay. We would say tonic. We would say, yeah. Only old people in Boston would say tonic. We've been, we've, swi not, we've switched to, we switched to soda now. <laughs> See, in Boston, people don't understand in Boston, when a word ends in ER, you make it sound like A. When it ends in A, you make it sound like ER. Daka, daka, daka. So daka, 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 <laughs> and soda. So now I'm going to demonstrate Project Atomic, and I don't think I'm prepared for this, but um, <laughs> <laughs> questions? Let's see if I can do this. I haven't. Okay, so am I in a container right now? Hopefully, I'm not in a container. So here we have. All right, so one of the things I can do here is I can actually create my container with all sorts of labels in it. This is a standard Docker file. It's not, there's no special, there's no special packages we have here. Um, we also use labels for identifying, uh, there's, all, there's no information in a container right now to tell you what the name of the application is. Okay, it's not built into anything in JSON file. So now we've added the ability for us to say, it's Apache, it's version 1.0, it's released that. Hey, the vendor, it's Red Hat. We're going to license it. But we can basically put any string we want in here. We have a, we have a document that we're trying to, we're, we're working with that core OS and other people to sort of standardize what some of these basic labels are, primary labels are. Um, and, um, but basically, so what this is going to, theoretically, if this works, and I didn't test it beforehand, it's going to install a uh, Apache server onto the system, and um, it should set it up with a unifile, system to unifile, and let's see. So I'll do a Docker build again. Okay. Should pre pre stage this. Oh, let's uh, let's as this builds. Anybody have any questions? We'll jump ahead to the question section. Nothing. You guys all think this is awesome? So, uh, yeah, insanity. I, was, I was talking to you about the issues I ran into with uh, with Docker Build, where the application is trying to set the ID binary in the build phase. Yeah. There's no like dash dash privilege for the build phase. Right. Like, okay. No, there's not. Okay. There's a um, Docker right now refuses to screw around with Docker Build anymore. There is a new tool called Docker Ramp. That's in the experimental stage right now. Um, <laughs> uh, That's why you don't do these live. Um, all right, you guys are gonna. We're gonna leave this as an example for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the app needs to be changed to DNF. No, I think DNF that is going to work because it's mm -hmm. so. Like a third party, like, uh, yeah, I think I think this is related to the, the network, the network oh, yeah. Anyways, trust me, it works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, if you pull that, if you go out and do an atomic pull of rel tools, you'll see all this stuff. Uh, you could basically go back and play with the atomic uh, atomic command. It's kind, it's really kind of cool. And what we're looking to do is add additional commands. As I talked about earlier, it was going to be an atomic scan. Which atomic scan will pull down a scanning container, run in the system, and actually scan all the containers running in the system. Uh, so we want to start to build out, and I can actually show you some other. Um, so if I did an atomic. So right now we have uh, atomic host, which I explained. Info basically shows you the labels. Um, install, explain that. Um, image list all the images. Uh, one of the interesting things here, when we get to scanning, we want to be able to mount a Docker container without running the Docker container. Right now, Docker has no way of doing that. So what we've done is we've built tooling to be able to mount up images without actually running containers so that we can examine and look at the images to see if, uh, what kind of content, content they have. Um, these are all obvious. 
We also added upload. Now upload upload is probably going to get changed to push because it does pretty much what Docker push does, except it allows you to push to satellite server. It also allows you to push to pulp servers. So if you want to use something other than Docker registry, you can sort of compare this at that. Atomic Verify is kind of an interesting tool in that it's looking at the labels. Imagine you have a container on your system that's MongoDB based on top of RHEL 7 or MongoDB based on top of RHEL, uh, on top of Fedora. If Fedora starts taking advantage of these labels, I think we have taken advantage of these labels, right? we want to start in incrementing the releases. So we'd have Fedora 23, release 1, Fedora 23, release 2, Fedora 23, release 3. Now I build an application on top of Fedora 23, base 2, and I have a whole application suite on my machine. What Atomic Ver Verify will do is look at the uh, application I have installed in my uh, host, and we'll say, oh, you're, you're getting an application that's based on Fedora 23.1. I notice that there's a Fedora 23.7 available. You might want to rebuild your Docker container. Doesn't necessarily tell you the security vulnerability, but just tells you that Fedora is, is like five new versions of the same image that you were using that your application is based on, so you, you might want to think about rebuilding it. So it'll tell you that. Atomic Scan is the one that's going to come in and actually do a security scan to look at the container. See if you're susceptible to the CVEs or, or you have bad configuration, your Etsy password file is completely like that. Um, so, those are all, like, all the commands that are available for Atomic. So, going back, I, I jumped over the, the Docker build problem. Yeah, Docker build right now um, does not support any type of dash dash privilege uh, activity. So, if you're, if you're inside of a container and you're trying to do special things on the file system, it won't work. And I don't know if there's a real way to fix that problem. But you can build a container using Docker commit. So you can build a container using Docker Anybody else, any other questions? You all want to play with SPCs? Well, let me give you a couple of SPCs that right now don't work well. And we'll, we'll work to fix them. So what happens if you have an SPC that's going to load a kernel module? I want to load the kernel module in the kernel. So we, we, right now we can do that with an SPC. But what happens if that kernel module is required to configure the network that Docker needs in order to run? What happens if I have to install a container for Docker as well? All right, so all of our containers right now, Docker is basically tried, Docker Corporation wants the Docker daemon to be central to the existence of containers. I think it's a colossal mistake that they did that. So what we're, we're trying to do is work with Docker to break the path of the, the Docker container. So two of the announcements earlier this summer were around open container formats, so Docker that no longer controls the container format. And that was mainly to get CoreOS and Docker and anybody else. We don't want to end up with we don't want to end up with RPM and um, yeah, uh, you know, two different formats that everybody in the industry has to fight about. We want everybody to consolidate on one container format. So that we don't have this, this fractionalization in the environment. If that's going to happen, it can't be under the control of one company. Right? So basically, open container format, basically, I think it's not on the Linux, the Linux Foundation. I think Red Hat has a couple people on it. Docker has a couple people on it. CoreOS has a couple people on it. So they're specifying what the container image format is. Another thing that Docker spun off is a thing called Run C. Run C is a little tool that it allows you to run containers. What they didn't, spe didn't split off is a thing called RAFC, it's a RAF driver. So if I install a container image, it's going to be based on top of something like OpenLayFS or on top of um, the better device mapper or uh, .rfs. When I install the image, it's installed, and that's called the graph driver. So where that content gets installed is on what's called the graph driver. So right now, there's no way to take a container image, mount it up so one C can do it, other than using the Docker DB. So we're working real hard right now to get a proof of concept of the graph driver being a separate program. If we can get graph driver out of Docker, now we could build a systemd unit file that would execute the graph driver to mount the container and then use run C to run the container and do a super focused container without ever using the Docker name. So we could do it really early in the new process. So that's one of one of our uh, goals going forward is to get graph C graph C into uh, into the open. And I think we have a good chance of it, whether or not Docker 
think likes my idea as much as I do or now. Um, but then what we slowly were trying to do is get the Docker daemon now to have all these low level libraries and low level function calls that you, know, you can do you container low level or you can do it with the Docker daemon but they separate it out of the process. Uh, we're also trying to get lots of system D content. The system D controls into Docker. I mean, one of the, one of the pro big problems in my mind is the Docker doesn't like system D. So I'm actually going to system D conf to do a talk called Docker versus system D. And I talk about how both sides are love to, uh, I'm in the middle of the two sides fighting all the time. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so they, they don't get along very well. Yes. So that's one of the things that I ran into is like Docker is like just walking through it's like, you know, one process per per container. Right. One service per per container. Right. I, I hate when it gives it one process. Okay. Apache runs five processes. Oh, that's so, true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, it's one, uh, so microservice, the idea of microservices is, is one service per container. Um, and and that's a, that should be everybody's goal. Yeah. But the problem is everybody's not going to get there very quickly. Yeah. So everybody that runs uh, multi service containers right now, um, the problem is it's not a good tool for doing that. So there's been a tool called Supervisor D that's been out there for running multiple service in the container. I hate it. It's Python and took my whole thing. There is a great tool for doing that. It's called System D because that's its job. Yeah, so system D is yeah. working on a system D integration. Uh, the problem is that Ubuntu did not adopt System D early enough before Docker became Docker. Yeah. Uh, so now they have the excuse that uh, System D is everywhere. And I'm saying it is going to be everywhere, but they said, well, it isn't everywhere yet. So, um, so what I've been trying to do is get yeah. uh, Docker to adopt. To adopt, to adopt the functions to make system D work well inside of the container. Right. And there's a, there's a considerable battle going on there. Yeah. Docker doesn't like system D. Right. And I'm trying real hard not to block heavily on, yeah, I mean, on the, this fight. I, I probably mean, shouldn't say much more. I mean, uh, I have, yeah, I'm, I'm working on the remote desktop technologies in Fedora. Yeah. And the close to that thing is DDI. Right. And there's lots of interest in using, you know, the, the, with DDI within containers, right. rather than separate, you know, human digging processes. And there's already a commercial company uh, with open source products called QBD that's using LFC. Okay. I don't know if there's anybody doing Docker yet for entire desktop environments. Yeah, I know that there's a, I know there's an atomic desktop effort going on. Have you looked at what um, Alex Lawson's doing with XDGF? Yeah, I was just trying to ask you about that. They're running the, the same, the, the sandbox aspect that, you know, that's why I'm running the app on top of you. Right, well, yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, the, he, 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 he actually, do, uh, Alex and I worked together originally on, on Docker, yeah. and then he went off to work on that. So it, it, yeah, that, cool. that spec does not use Docker, doesn't have to use open container format. He's using a different format, but he's actually using RPM OS3, so it's kind of like, a strange world. The, the, the XDG app is yeah. XDG app is a container format that's being developed to run desktop applications and individual containers, sandboxed applications. Um, um, and it's it, it, take a look at it. It's kind of it's kind of neat. And, and so, sometime in the future, you might be running Firefox and Open Office and other tools all inside a container. In my glorious vision of the world, I'd be running uh, Android apps inside of one. I don't know if that's I don't know if that's really possible, but it'd be really cool. Yeah. You know, there's all the phone in Castle. It's just a phone would be a great thing on the computer rather than right. Well, yeah, <laughs> by, the Firefox, the, the latest Firefox vulnerability is also uh, the, the, what what the XDG app would allow you to do is basically take the open you know, when you click open inside of Firefox instead of it actually going out and open files on the disk, it would send a signal to the desktop and say, "Hey, I need a file." And that desktop then would open up the file browser. And you'd go select your file, and then the desktop would hand the file into open up right into Firefox. So now Firefox would have no access to anything other than content inside its container, and the desktop would be sticking content into the container or Firefox that I want to save content. It would go to the file browser outside. So think about think about applications like that. But so, I mean, I'm very interested in actually doing that for the sandbox yeah. apps, but like the other use cases, you know. Virtual desktop container, so that's inherently multiple processes. Right. It's not the multiple, oh, the right. multiple services. So I mean, so the things things about running system D inside of a container, there's, there's about five fundamental things that are broken when running system D inside of a container. If you look at my, I have a dash dash init patch. So yeah. Docker run dash dash init equals system D. Yeah. Patch right. that basically fixes those five fundamental things that allow you to run system D inside of a Docker right now. Oh, oh, okay. 
these three are all with that patches that are accepting your patches or are you using them? Huh? Uh, is Docker accepting your patches or Docker basically wants me to do it totally on the L. They want to basically have a command line that looks like an SPC command to do it. But there's some fundamental problems with doing that. So Docker right now is trying to implement everything required to run system D as individual commands. So okay. for instance, to run system D inside of a container, you have to have slash run as the template class. Yeah. You have to have container UUID inside of the container specifying the UUID of the container so system D will create an SE machine ID file. Right. You need to have biolog journal yeah. UUID mounted into the container because you want to see the container contents from the journal outside. You have that as um, measurement. That's what's uh, you want to register machines, so you have to have uh, machine control register machines so that the journal D M command will work. So there's like five things that have to be done. The problem is it's a chicken and egg, it's the system is so just when I create a container UUID, that's created by Docker mm -hmm. inside the container. So I need that value in order to set everything. Uh, right now, so Docker's saying do everything outside of this, and I feel I'm saying it's impossible. Yeah. The main question though is like, you know, say Docker is going to just project by a four-pop you know, four company, and like, are they yeah. willing to work with you guys on the uh, system yeah. innovation? Right, I mean, and, and, like, and, no, and, like, and yeah. some of our response is if they're not going to be willing, then we're going to work with the open source company. We're going to work to slowly make Docker less, less important. Okay. So, you know, as I said, that's, that's one, of the, one of the reasons we do it one of the things that we do. The funny thing is Lib Container, which is, man, is, is an open source project now, actually, so that's still controlled by Docker, but they're more responsive to, to add new functionality to the state than uh, they are to the Docker Daemon. Docker Daemon, the, the, one of the big problems with the Docker Daemon, too, is that it's client server. So, if you man a system D service inside of a container that's running Docker Run, which most people do right now, yeah. that Docker run is not a child, a direct child of system D, it's a direct child of Docker D. So the client program ends up being a direct child of system D. It communicates with the Docker. So if you go into the system D unifile and say, I want to have this C groups apply to my uh, container, yeah. it doesn't work. You're applying it to the Docker client. It's not applied to Docker D. So right. Docker D doesn't pass it down. Okay. So there's lots of problems with using a client server application the way Docker but we've been working to fix some of these problems for the last year and a half. Yeah. And I'm showing too much frustration. So Atomic Tool, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Atomic Tool is basically our, our idea. Right now it's it's available in Fedora, Rawhide, CentOS, RHEL. So you can use Atomic Tool everywhere. And it's Atomic Tool is not only on Project Atomic, and not just on Atomic Post. You can yum install Atomic anywhere. So it'll run very well on the full uh, uh, Fedora platform. Anything else? That's good. Make sure you grab container coloring books if you haven't done one. And, uh, thanks for coming. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think I'm signed up to do uh, SPC training on Saturday. Saturday. So if we want to come in and play and we can get any internet connectivity, we can actually play and try to set up something. Uh, you know, the container you want to set up and play with. Atomic, we can sit here and uh, right. sign the coloring books. I will sign the <laughs> You need a. Uh, as Red Hat Summit, Mari Duffy kit, too. I know. Mari Duffy. So if you, if you want to get a collector's item, yeah. that's worth probably about 15 cents on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that can get me it's it's worth a lot of credit. You need, you need a uh, uh, Sharp. Sharpie to, to the trail of pens won't write on the, the, the password. Thanks for coming.